Hello and welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's film is 1951's 14 Hours, directed by Henry Hathaway. It's impossible to estimate from our point of vantage down here on the street exactly how many people are here galvanized, held spellbound by the breathtaking spectacle of a young unidentified man perched on a ledge 15 stories above the street. <laughs> This is a story of suspense-filled seconds, moments of passion and dramatic fervor, a whole city keyed to fever pitch with the heart throbs and heart pangs of exciting people whose amazing lives burst into vivid relief in 14 startling hours. I don't know from nothing about what you think you're doing or why, but you look like a nice kid to me. I hate to see you make a bad mistake. You ought to come in and think it over. Do you think you can do anything with him? Do you want to talk? Yeah, I don't oh, know. Oh, don't I... let him! Haven't you done enough Chris, damage? Have you so much to okay, speak to? Okay, okay, now listen, both of you. I got enough on my hands without this. I'm trying to talk your kid out of taking a dive. I could have gone on for a long time, except for this. And, and missed you by half an hour all the time. If you ever say that again, if you ever so much as touch her, I'll kill you. I'm going to do everything I can to get him back in. I'm sorry, but if there's any chance that he has a girl that might help get him back in, I'm going to find out about her, even if I have to be a little rough on you. Can't stand everybody crowding me, trying to make me do things. I've got to make up my own mind. Take her away now! I love you. I need you and I want you. That's all. I, I won't ask you to do anything you don't want to do. Time for another history lesson, and this one's going to be a bit offbeat. Don't fret, like every history lesson I impart, it has something to do with tonight's film. In the 1950s, there was no such thing as homosexuality. Not in public, anyway. Oh, sure, there was Quentin Crisp and Liberace, but Quentin was mostly known for the book he co-authored, The Naked Civil Servant, not reaching any sort of public recognition until the mid-70s, and... Liberace sued the hell out of anyone who even intimated that he was a two-fisted all-American man pretty much until his death, even though it was plainer than flies in a pail of milk that he was gay. Now, the reason for this is because, as I just stated, there was no such thing as homosexuality in the 50s. There were plenty of, of gay men and lesbians, but to publicly admit that you were gay was tantamount to suicide, both professional and social. It didn't matter how well you did your job, how well you liked you were in the community, how good a person you were in every aspect of your life. If you were discovered to be gay, you may as well pack your stuff and move to another country. It was just instant pariah. There was no reasoning or explaining or anything like that. You were shunned. Things have improved tremendously for the LGBTQ populace these days, and that's a good thing in my opinion. I know a good amount of gay people of both sexes, although, to tell the truth, there are a lot more than just, you know, there are a lot more sides than just two. And they're great people. I don't even see them as LGBTQ. I just see them as friends. And if they treat me nicely, I treat them the same way. Now, having been born in the mid-50s, I wasn't always as enlightened as I am now. You know, I didn't go out beating up fags or anything, but I kept my distance. Once things started changing in this country, and speaking for myself as a critical thinking, not liberal, not, liberal, not conservative, but open-minded American, it's about time this happened. I left my prejudices aside and approached the idea of gay people as just people, 
And I found a lot of great people that I'm proud to call friends. I actually remember the first moment I realized that my thinking about gay people was as wrong as it could have been. I was at a party one time, this was many, many years ago, that a friend invited me to, and he was the only person I knew with this shebang. Now, normally, that's a very iffy situation for me. I have a hard time assimilating into a crowd of total strangers, you know, unless they're viewers. The few Cleveland Classic cinema, cinema picnics I've hosted were real blowouts, and it was great meeting everyone. And when I arrived at said party, it was deliriously obvious that most, if not all, of the guys there were gay. You know, big Sally, Jesse, Raphael type glasses, flamboyant print shirts, ascots, and very fashionable pants and shoes. Immaculately dressed young men, most of them lisping and all very effeminate. I was a little nervous at first, but no one tried to yank me into a bedroom, so I relaxed. It was in a huge Victorian type duplex full of Art Deco furniture. It was really nice. And after a while, I went, to, went out to sit on the veranda like front porch as it was, it was a lovely day. Eventually, a gaggle of these young gay guys came out and joined me. Well, I was okay with that. Like I said, they were very nice and polite, and to my very great surprise, incredibly funny. You know, looking back on it, I suppose that if you had to grow up gay at that time, a sense of humor was absolutely essential, if only to keep from killing yourself. Well, I sat out there on that lovely day and just listened to these guys appraising the fashion sense of the people passing by and basically laughing my ass off at what they were saying. That afternoon pointed me down the path that led me to the conclusion that a personal sexual preferences didn't matter any more than the color of their skin did, and that's a fact. I like to say, and I'll clean up my observation for TV, that idiot knows no color, but the inverse is also true. Good people come in all shapes, sizes, personalities, colors, and personal preferences. The sooner everyone realizes that, the better off we'll all be. I just hope no other letters get added to the LGBTQ thing because it's a mouthful as it is. No pun intended. 14 Hours is based on the true story of a young man named John W. Ward who climbed out on a ledge on the 17th floor of the Hotel Gotham in New York City. He was there for 18 hours before the situation resolved itself in his jumping to his death. Although this film is classified as a film noir and it does have elements of that genre, I don't really think of it at I don't really think of it that way. It's more of a psychological suspense film. It begins on the morning of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. A room service waiter, played by Frank Phelan, who some viewers will recognize as Ernie, the cab driver from It's a Wonderful Life, and the father in The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, delivers an order to a room but soon finds the occupant, whom he just seen, is nowhere to be found. Searching the suite, he sees an open window and finds a young man standing on a ledge. In the street below, a foot patrolman is writing traffic tickets when a woman's scream alerts him to the situation. He goes up to the room and develops a rapport with a suicidal young man. Things grow exponentially from there. I obviously don't want to give too much away here, so to begin, let me point out how many soon-to-be famous faces there are in this movie. First of all, and most obvious, is Grace Kelly in her first movie role. She is a lovely woman, no doubt, but she really doesn't make an impression here. Gary Cooper noticed her, however, and snagged her for a co-starring role in his next movie, 1952's High Noon. Unfortunately, that movie wasn't enough to gain any interest, and after filming the movie, she went back to doing stage and television work for several years before she landed a starring role in Alfred Hitchcock's 1954 film Dial M for Murder, at which point her career took off. I think Grace Kelly was a very pretty woman, but I never quite got her appeal. I don't know why, but I just never found her all that attractive. Maybe it's because I prefer redheads and brunettes. As the young couple would meet in the crowd while watching the drama unfold, Deborah Paget and Jeffrey Hunter appear in ingenue roles, marking their first steps towards stardom. Joyce Van Patten also appears in her first movie role in an uncredited role as Paget's friend, Barbara. Many other recognizable actors and actresses appear in this movie as well, although their appearances are either incidental roles or extras. Harold Peary is the day manager at the hotel, Sandra Gould, the second Gladys Kravitz on Bewitched, as the hotel phone operator, Frank Nelson as an impatient hotel guest, Harvey Lembeck and Ossie Davis as cab drivers, 
And Richard Beamer, John Cassavetes, Brad Dexter, Leif Erickson, and Brian Keith as extras. Director Henry Hathaway was born on March 13, 1898 in Sacramento, California. He started his career as a child actor in movies directed by pioneer film director Alan Dwan, later working as an assistant director under Frank Lloyd, Paul Byrne, Joseph von Sternberg, and Victor Fleming. Hathaway watched these directors work and learned his craft from them. He directed 67 features during his long career and was known for being very hard on actors. He once said, to be a good director, you've got to be a bastard. I'm a bastard, and I know it. Bastard or not, he directed two actors to Oscar. Richard Widmark as Tommy Udo in 1947's Kiss of Death, and John Wayne as Rooster Cogburn in 1969's True Grit. His last film was 1974's Hang Up. Henry Hathaway died from a heart attack on February 11, 1985 in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. Richard Basehart was born on August 31, 1914 in Zanesville, Ohio. He appeared in 113 movies and TV shows over the course of his long career, starting on the stage and appearing in his first film, Repeat Performance, in 1947. His third film, 1948's He Walked by Night, has popped up on this very show, and after appearing in tonight's film, he was hired by Federico Fellini to appear in his 1954 film La Strada. Basehart was flattered that Fellini felt he was worthy of appearing in this movie and asked him why he was chosen. Fellini answered, because if you did what you did in 14 hours, you could do anything. This is an excellent point. While Basehart does have a good amount of dialogue in tonight's movie, what he does with his facial expressions and body language is incredible. He shows fear, confusion, hatred, empathy, and hope at different points without saying a word. Something else he gets across is his hidden homosexuality. He's made up to look slightly, very slightly effeminate, but his reactions when his mother and ex fiance show up speak volumes, although the H word is never even hinted at, much less spoken. The subtext is there nonetheless, and it'll be easy to spot now that you know it is. Basehart is probably best remembered for his stint as Admiral Harriman Nelson of the Seaview in TV's Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. He was quite busy in television all through the 50s and 60s and into the 80s. He had a marvelous voice, deep, commanding, but somehow reassuring at the same time, and did a lot of narration and voiceover work. He narrated the TV show Knight Rider and read a Greek poem for the closing of the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. Richard Basehart died after a series of strokes on September 17, 1984, in Los Angeles, California. Paul Douglas was born Paul Douglas Fleischer on April 11, 1907 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He appeared in a scant 55 movies and television shows, which is kind of sad for someone of his talents. His father was a well-to-do doctor, and Paul grew up in comfort. While attending high school, he was bitten by the acting bug, but his love of sports was stronger, and he played football for a semi-pro team in Frankfurt before moving into broadcasting as a sports announcer and master of ceremonies. He dabbled in acting on the stage, but soon returned to radio, where he was Jack Benny's announcer for a time before going to work with Fred Allen and George Burns and Gracie Allen. At this point, he was a valued commodity in radio, making up to $2,500 a week when he suddenly decided to give all that up and return to the stage at two fifty dollars a week, playing the gruff businessman Harry Brock in the Broadway production of Born Yesterday with Judy Holliday and Gary Merrill. The show was a smash hit, and he remained with it through, it through all 1,024 performances, picking up the Theatre World and Clarence Derwent acting prizes. His first film was 1949's A Letter to Three Wives, directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz. He was offered the part he originated on Broadway in the film version of Born Yesterday, but he turned it down after reading the adapted screenplay, feeling that his character had been watered down too much to push Judy Holliday and William Holden, the co-stars. He went on to appear in his own starring roles and proved himself equally adept at comedy as well as drama, appearing in a couple of light-hearted baseball movies, 1949's It Happens Every Spring, a film about a college professor that develops a liquid that repels wood, and 1951's Angels in the Outfield. Douglas had a natural likability about him that made him very engaging on screen. He seemed like the kind of guy you could have a beer with. 
Paul Douglas died of a heart attack on September 11th, 1959 in Hollywood, California. He was only 52 years old. Agnes Moorhead was born Agnes Robertson Moorhead on December 6, 1900 in Clinton, Massachusetts. Called the Lavender Lady because her favorite color was purple. She started out in theater and radio, being part of the ensemble that made up Orson Welles' Mercury Theater on the air, and later appeared in 112 movies and TV shows during her long career, starting with her role in the 1941 classic Citizen Kane, playing Charles Foster Kane's mother. Wells had wanted her to play the Nazi hunter in 1946 as a stranger, but the studio shot that idea down and the role instead went to Edward G. Robinson. She had first turned down the role she's best known for, that of Samantha's mother and Dora in the TV show Bewitched, but changed her mind after running into Elizabeth Montgomery in a department store. Montgomery tearfully asked her in person to take the part and Moorhead relented. She didn't like the role and was a bit annoyed that she was best known for it. Another thing she didn't like about it was having to get up and uh, get up at 4 a.m. every day to be in makeup by 6 a.m. and then usually working through to 8 p.m. at night. She was a pro, however, and gave the role her best. Unfortunately, she was also part of the ill-fated cast that worked on 1956's The Conqueror. Shot in the Nevada desert a bit too close to where the government had been doing nuclear testing, just about the entire cast and crew, including Susan Hayworth, John Wayne and director Dick Powell died of cancer years later. Pedro Armendariz, who, is also, who also contracted cancer from the shoot, killed himself on June 18, 1963, after finishing his last role, that of Karen Bay in 1963's For Mercy With Love. Agnes Moorhead was an outstanding actress, and it's fitting that she was annoyed at being remembered for a role in Bewitched that was, to tell the truth, beneath her talents. Her performance in this movie as the bitterly disappointed mother of the main character is amazing. She goes from completely hysterical to playing the wounded woman without a pause, and it's incredible to watch. I should point out here that my use of the word hysterical is inaccurate. Hysteria is a medical term describing the condition of having the symptoms of a disease or a condition without actually having the condition itself. For example, in hysterical pregnancy. Learn something new every show. Agnes Moorhead died of uterine cancer on April 30th, 1974 in Rochester, Minnesota. There are quite a few other character actors in this film that deserve a bio, but time constraints prevent me from giving them the proper nod. 14 Hours is a very well-made movie. I know that the scenes on the ledge and in the window were shot in the studio, and I'm fairly sure the city was done in back projection. The same way I did this very show, before my producer decided to get fancy and use green screens like we do now. However it was done, it was done very well. The story is gripping, the acting is wonderful all the way through, and I think if this is your first time seeing this film, you'll appreciate it. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy 14 hours, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. <laughs>